Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show on Talk Radio 1190. It's more than just mosquito talk. Mosquito Steve will talk about natural products, organics, good business practices, and more. And now, here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Howdy, howdy, everybody. It's Mosquito Steve. Welcome to the Mosquito Steve Show. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, We have a great guest, an incredible guest, and we got lots of exciting stuff to talk about. Um, With us today, um, once again, is Meg Curry. Hello, hello. And uh, Meg is with iHeartMedia, and she's the one uh, that is going to take my place here in a couple of weeks when I'm no longer on air. (laughs) I'm just Uh... kidding. I just wanted to see what her face would do when I did that. Um, Also on air with us today is somebody that looks like he's 12 years old, uh, but he's actually, I swear to God, this is where the Doogie Howser thing came from. So Dr. Scott Selinski. Um, who doesn't uh, even your pictures on the internet don't look like now we've talked on the phone we've we've emailed but this is the first time i've met him and i mean really i'm not kidding i'm kind of thinking you're actually the son of dr scott lewinsky lewinsky oh no no not that's a whole other that's a whole other deal this is not a political show we're not going to do any lewinsky talk today so no selinsky Selinski, Dr. Scott Selinski. So, Thanks for having me. Welcome, and um, he is uh, he's a, a, a doctor. You're a cancer surgeon, right? I don't know Sur- what he call it. Surgical oncologist. Surgical oncologist. 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 So we're gonna say a lot of words, words. that I don't understand. Big words that I don't understand. So. Uh, Let's first talk about what's going on around here uh, with mosquitoes. And um, I t- obviously, it's been a big week. Zika is stealing all the headlines, uh, especially because of what's happening over in Florida. So we do have a localized case of, uh, of actually, we've got 15 localized cases of the Zika virus there. And so um, what that means is that instead of um, somebody going to the Caribbean and coming back and then somebody having sex with them and getting Zika, This actually came from a mosquito biting the person who had Zika and then carrying it to another person that has Zika. And so this is all contained, and this is what's different about this compared to, say, West Nile virus. This is all contained in a one one square mile area. Um, And there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is because the mosquitoes that carry it, the 80s species, don't travel that far. So a Culex mosquito may travel a mile or two even to get a blood meal and so or to get to an area where there is more um, more possibilities of blood meal um, an 80s aegypti or 80s albopictus which carry the zika um, tend to just stay well they're the, first of all they fly low to the ground they stay very localized um, they are you know pretty much in your yard or within 100 yards 200 yards of uh, there and so, um, so they're able to contain this. That's what's great. So lucky for the people of Florida, they're not having a big outbreak where everybody needs to panic. But this is what we can expect throughout the rest of the South. Um, I do think if it's going to spread, this is going to happen um, in other places. And it'll be um, uh, where, you know, the, it'll be contained into a small area. That's why if you have Zika... You need to stay indoors. Do not go outside because then a mosquito can bite you and then pass it on. So it's important that you stay indoors. If you have been to those areas that uh, have Zika, uh, you need to, you know, be responsible. And if you have a little fever, you don't feel good, you need to go see a doctor or just stay indoors until it passes, which will be a few days. So most of the time, the symptoms are very mild. It's a mild flu most people don't even ever show symptoms. Um, and so the big concern here is with the pregnant woman and the microencephaly. So down in Puerto Rico, they're just now starting to have the babies um, that have uh, from the infected um, Zika moms. And so they're, they're, they don't even know what the impact's going to be for taking care of all those um, microencephaly babies. And so it's really sad. I mean, they're cute little things, and, and uh, but they're going to have a problem on their hands. That's a big public concern because that's a lot of money. In places like Puerto Rico, which is already pretty much bankrupt, I don't know how they're going to take care of all those those little kids. Um, I know that's where Meg's going on her mission trip um, starting next month. Yes. So that's <laughs> 
So, um, so anyway, so the, if you think that you might have Zika virus, if you've got flu-like symptoms, then if you think you can weather it, then uh, then stay home. If you are 94 years old and think you have Zika, then go to the doctor or call the doctor. If you're um, under, you know, three years old and you're listening to this and you think you have Zika, you need to go to the doctor. But, you know, if you're a healthy, normal person, you don't need to worry that much about Zika. Um, and it's just really uh, when you're pregnant or if you're planning on getting pregnant. So month and a half ago, they were saying, um, oh, Zika passes through in three days. You don't need to worry about it after three days. Then they come out and said, okay, well, wait. Now it's really a week. So that means that if you travel overseas, you get Zika and you come back, you need to not have sex for a week. That's it. Well, now they're saying it stays in your system for two weeks. So my, I'm wondering, well, are they going to raise it to three weeks? I mean, it seems to be going up. It's not going down. So maybe at some point they're going to say, no, it's in your system for three weeks. So um, so I would just say um, don't have sex with somebody that has been over <laughs> to uh, – that's gone to Rio. I hate to say it, but when you guys get back from Rio, uh, we I love the Olympic team, but do not have sex, please, when you come back for a while, at least a while. And so uh, that's really what it comes down to. So this is not a show about sex, in case you've just uh, just tuned in. <laughs> this is really a show about mosquitoes, and yet, um, but we are typically all over the map. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit more of that because Max Heron, because uh, Dr. Selinsky is not just a cancer doctor, he also raises honeybees. And so the way we got to know each other is um, he actually uses mosquitoes to even his yard, yep. and he's got a couple of little girls. And um, huh? And a pregnant wife. And a pregnant wife now. Oh, really? That's the big reason that we got in touch with you. Is she she wouldn't go outside in the backyard. Oh my gosh, I forgot Zika. about that. How pregnant is she? Um, she's seven months. Wow, that is incredible. Holy mm-hmm. mackerel! Do you know if it's a boy or a girl yet? Uh, we're hoping. Yep. Yep. <laughs> one one of the two. Yep. One uh, of the two. <laughs> we'll find out yep. when it comes out. There you go. Yeah, you got to kind of you got to put your mouth right up to that microphone. It's kind of weird that way. It's so um, no. and it'll drive Will nuts because he'll turn it up and then you back up and he's got yeah. It's it's a, that's what you do if you really want to make Will mad. Then do a lot of this and that will really upset him because the levels <laughs> change. So um, well, that is that's incredible. So you have firsthand experience with the the pregnancy and the fear of the Zika virus. Because that's mm-hmm. the thing. The whole country's panicking about this. And, and most of the country, 99% of the country doesn't need to worry about Zika. In fact, I no. did a dozen radio shows in the last week up in Michigan, Wisconsin, Ontario, um, I mean, or Montreal, all up north Seattle. They don't, mm-hmm. They're not having Zika up there. Well, they don't have 80 species up there. Now, they actually could have somebody travel up there that's got Zika. And a Culex mosquito can actually carry the virus over to someone else. Um, so there is a possibility, but it's not very likely that they're going to have the outbreaks up north like they have down in Florida. Yeah. So, so as a doctor, and uh, so you're at Baylor. Yep. You're at Baylor, Baylor downtown. Here. Okay. Uh, Baylor downtown. Okay. So, um, is that is there a whole bunch of scuttlebutt around the halls of the hospital talking about Zika? Is everybody freaking out there? I try to stay out of the emergency room, which is probably where it's going to be talked about more. Yeah. So I haven't really heard much at the hospital. Um, it's probably more in doctors' offices that people are seeing seeing that rather than hospitalizations at this point. Okay. Well, so, I mean, isn't that all you hang out with is doctors? So, I mean, come on. It's, yeah, in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, and I got to tell you, it's still to the, I mean, I'm sitting, I just can't believe, I just can't believe how young you look. This is really, this is the Doogie Howser story. So, in fact, I looked online um, to get some information about you. And um, let me see, I found out that you specialize in colon, these are the surgeries you specialize in. Tell me where I'm wrong here. Mm-hmm. Colon cancer, gallbladder cancer, hernia, liver cancer, melanoma, neuroendocrine, mm-hmm tumors, pancreatic diseases, and stomach cancer. Hernia seems out of place. Oh, that's that's the general surgery training that I did before the specialized cancer surgery. So okay. I, I, I'll okay. do your general surgery, take out your regular gallbladder and hernia, but what I do more kind of day-to-day is the real big cancer surgeries, especially specialized in, in pancreas and liver cancer. 
do a lot of research in pancreas cancer. Um, one of the directors of our pancreas cancer research and uh, treatment center at Baylor, and we do a lot of kind of cutting edge treatment of pancreas cancer clinical okay. studies. Is it uh, robotic? I've heard a lot about robotic. Yep, we do. Um, we do minimally invasive and robotic surgery. Uh, there's a handful of places in the country that'll do kind of the biggest pancreas surgery, the Whipple operation with the robot, and we're we're one of them. Well, awesome. I would think if uh, you need to operate on a robot, isn't it and more of an engineer than a doctor? Uh, I mean, come uh, on. Uh, 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 you're sorry, sorry. Yeah. Well, my other Some question days. was. <laughs> so I need a, a gastric sleeve. Can you do that too? I need. <laughs> I don't do those. <laughs> I do want to talk about some overall health issues. I, I really do. Because obviously you've discovered the fountain of youth. And uh, and so uh, and I obviously have discovered uh, the fountain of soda and, <laughs> or something. And so um, so I do want to talk to you a little bit about um, just overall health. I've got a lot of questions about that. And so mm-hmm. um, I don't get to talk to doctors much. So this is going to be uh, I'm going to ask a lot of personal questions. I'm sorry. I can't <laughs> help it. So anyways, we are coming up on a break. So we're going to take a minute and uh, listen to a word from our sponsors and then we're going to come back. Um, and uh, once again, we got Dr. Scott Selinski and Meg Curry here with us. So please come back after this word from our sponsors. I can see. Welcome back to the Mosquito Steve Radio Show. It's the Elton Hour, John. Here. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, by the way, um, I appreciate everybody listening. Tell your friends they can listen to the show all over the world, um, streaming live on uh, iHeartRadio. Talk Radio 1190. So thanks for joining us again. I am Mosquito Steve, and the reason I'm Mosquito Steve is because I've literally done hundreds of tests to stand outside and count how many mosquitoes land on me so that I can determine what products work, how long they work, and stuff like that. And I am partial to natural products. We actually, um, most of our products are, there, or all of our products are based on essential oils. And so um, we've actually tested them, and they've, in most cases, they're better than the chemicals. And so um, it's really interesting. The you know I don't know if you've been keeping up with the stuff that's going on in Florida. One of the stories is the pesticides are not working. And mm-hmm. so um, so I think you know that's what I've been trying to tell people. Mosquitoes actually adapt really really quick. And so um, I wish bees adapted that quickly. If they did, we wouldn't be having the troubles we are. But but uh, but mosquitoes adapt really quickly in Texas, North Texas. They um, used to, their larval stage used to be two weeks. It's actually now only five days. In a few short years, they went from larval stage of two weeks to five days because puddles don't stick around that long. They dry up because of the drought. And so that's how quickly they adapt. So they can adapt to pesticides and everything else. And so um, uh, imagine if women were only pregnant for, you'd probably love this because you have gone through this three times, yeah, four and a half months instead of nine months. But if they only, if they could do that in a matter of a few years, just change that quickly. There's just, it's, it, you can't even imagine that. So, um, so let me ask you, cause I, mm-hmm. cause pesticides are real, that's a real thorn in my side. And after reading so much about it, talking so much about it, and then um, I've also been interviewed a whole bunch about the neonicotinoids and the effect they're having on the pollinators and things. And I don't want to get into the bees yet because I want to know more about your background and Mm -hmm. stuff. But as a cancer doctor, do you guys, I mean, what are your feelings about pesticides in general? Uh, Kind of all the chemicals that we're using in in our daily life now, we don't really know what the long-term effects of them are. And when we talk about things causing cancer, it's not you do it today and it causes cancer tomorrow. A lot of the things are going to be over your lifetime or over years that are going to um, end up with the deleterious effects, and we just don't know what they do. And obviously, they kill things, so yeah. they, they might not be real good for us. Yeah, that's I'm trying to tell. I always tell people, read your labels, read your labels. If it kills fish, if it kills cats, for instance, is that not a good indication that it's probably not good for us? Probably not. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of my thing. So, um, so you guys, yeah, I just I wanted to get. To, I know. Well, there's a reason why you guys are using our stuff, and uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit because I have to. I have to know the background is fascinating. After medium, once again, Doogie Hauser here. <laughs> so, um, you uh, your medical training is from George Washington University, then University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, and then Baylor in Houston, which That's, I didn't even know there was a Baylor in Houston. 
Well, everybody over the all over the country gets confused. Obviously, in Texas, we've got the three Baylors. There's Baylor Medical um, Center in Houston, which is the um, that's the or I'm sorry, it's Baylor College of Medicine. That's where I went okay. to medical school down in Houston. There's Baylor University in Waco, and there's Baylor University Medical Center up in Dallas, and Baylor and, College of Dentistry. And Baylor College of <laughs> Dentistry, which is now Texas A and M. Oh, so, is it really? <laughs> oh, I didn't know yeah, that. So, wow. So all of those used to be at some point related to to each other, but they're all separate entities now. Okay. So um, where are you originally from then? So I'm from um, – I, I claim San Antonio and Houston as, really? as home. Oh, I didn't you know, know that. That's, that's where I grew up. I went, I'm an Aggie. I went to A&M for undergrad and then Baylor um, down in Houston for medical school. I did my general surgery training and critical care um, – fellowship at George Washington in D.C., and then I did a fellowship in surgical oncology and hepatobiliary surgery in Pittsburgh. Then and, I came back what, home what to surgery? Texas. Wait, what surgery? Hepatobiliary. That's liver and pancreas. Oh, that's what, yes. I've that's actually got that word hi- highlighted. Yeah. I was going to ask you about it, <laughs> yep. but I wouldn't have been able to pronounce it to ask what it was mm-hmm. anyway. So, yep. so that's, that's the specialized Hep- surgery. Hepatobiliary. Just leave it to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's another one. There's a... Uh, there's uh, found on you this meso- mesothelioma, but it starts with peritoneal mesothelioma. Yeah, yeah. peritoneal mesothelioma. Peritoneal. So when you hear about asbestos, the the one that we talk about more is the the lung related peritoneal or the, the lung related lung related mesothelioma. So he has but trouble with actually, the easy words. <laughs> you can actually get um, get the same type of cancer in the lining of your abdomen, which is called the peritoneum. Uh, okay. So we do a big surgery for that. Okay. So let me see. You are licensed through 2017. Where are you going after that? Are you going to retire? <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, but, uh, I'll probably extend my license there. Well, I was going to ask how you stay in the heat here if you're from, what, Pittsburgh and D.C. Oh, no, or... I'm not from there. I'm from Houston. Yeah, so okay. I got the, the humidity and the heat Yeah. Oh, and we're so much cooler here than Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, okay. So I noticed that you're, um, uh, first of all, is, is there, I thought you were a runner cause you look like a runner, but then you don't look like you've ever been in the sun either. So that, that one wouldn't make sense, but he was the captain of the running team for Baylor's, um, pancreatic action network fundraiser. And yet you don't run. Uh, there, there was a walk that you could do a instead, walk. and I, I did the walk. I didn't do okay. the run. Okay. All right. Well, your, I do the your walk. Your knees probably thank you for it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So do your nephews. So um, anyway, see, I'm sorry. That was <laughs> – Dad, if you're listening, that was for you. So, uh, okay, <laughs> when you're dealing with tough cancers, even when the odds are not good, we do have people who do very well. And in my mind, all mm-hmm. of my patients are in the group that is going to do well – unless there's something that tells me they are not. So this is a quote I got from you in working with um, some of the peritoneal mesotheliomia. I keep saying omia, and it's just oma, but I'm almost mm-hmm. got it. So working with those patients. So um, so tell me what it – what I mean, this is – you're very well respected in that area as long as – and the pancreatic cancer. So what is the difference between the two? Um, what what drew you to that? I mean, you didn't wake up one morning and go, gosh, I wish I could work on pancreases. Well, if we want to go kind of all the way back, I when I was a kid, I just couldn't wait until I'd get into seventh grade because you got to dissect a frog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that That's kind of where it all started. I just loved the insides of things and how, how things worked and um, that – just always wanted to operate on people. Do frogs have pancreases? They do. I th- do they I really? Think, I think they – I'm pretty sure they oh. do. See, I um, did – I was the same way. I actually couldn't wait to dissect frogs and pigs, but um, <laughs> but then mm-hmm. I made a mess of them. You definitely <laughs> would, but none of my patients would be alive today if I was a surgeon. <laughs> I, did, I did my frog so fast in seventh grade that the teacher had to give me another one because I was done and all the, the rest of the class wasn't. And then I finished that one, and everybody else was still, you know, way far behind. So she had me get all the specimens ready for the test for everybody else. Wow. That is so cool. So I actually wanted, you know, I can trace back when I was a little kid. I wanted to be an inventor. So, you know, I see way back where where my, you know, my inventor's uh, nerve comes from now. And so mm-hmm. so you really, do you think that really was the beginning of you wanting to, to do this for a living? Mm-hmm. 
Oh my God, I just yep. cannot imagine all that blood. I just I'd be fainting every day. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, so mesothelioma, though, we, I see the commercials all the time on TV. That comes from asbestos, right? It's oftentimes related to asbestos. Doesn't have to be. Okay. Is any of that related to smoking? Uh, smoking does contribute to that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because I don't know, you're too young to remember, but when I was growing up, the doctors would go on TV in the 70s and they were in front of Congress saying, it's okay to smoke. Ah, don't pay attention to all that research. It doesn't matter. It's okay to smoke. I kind of feel like that's where we are with the pesticides. Um, I mean, is there, do you have a certain place where you go for research on things that the average person doesn't know about or that I can't find on Google? Um, I usually look on PubMed, which is where all the peer-reviewed uh, literature is. And okay. So anybody can can get there to at least find the abstracts. You need access to some libraries sometimes in order to be able to get the actual full papers. And then what you run into is sometimes those are a little above your head, um, but you can at least try. Okay. So is your wife listening on anything? Probably. And the little girls? One little girl. Right okay. Well, give them a yeah. shout out first. Hi, Violet. How you doing? Daddy's on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so, because I want to ask, so what, how, first of all, how'd you meet Laura? Uh, we met in uh, in college at A and M. Okay. So, what is she? She's smart too. Yeah, she's she's real smart. She she works for the government. Oh no! Oh no! Well, that's another story <laughs> then. So, what branch of the government? FBI. <laughs> oh boy! So we're being investigated <laughs> yeah. right now. So you already know me then, Laura. <laughs> I see. Let's. Uh... <laughs> Probably so. Wow. So, uh, well, good. Well, you stay pregnant then, okay? How about that? You stay out of the office. That's what I want to hear. So, um, okay, so we're going to start transitioning here into the B talk because um, I really want to know more about this. And uh, like I said, I've been talking to people a lot about bees lately. It's not just bees, but all pollinators that we've got to worry about. Mm -hmm. What What's so important about bees anyways? Well, the big thing is the, the pollination. If you look at... Uh, what we eat, 80% um, of the U.S. crops need bees to pollinate them in order to, to be produced. So they're, they're pretty important for our food. I'd say. So, um, and the, the neonicotinoids and those things are not just affecting the bees. They're the affecting the, the other insects, too. So mm -hmm. why bees? What, may, what got you interested in bees? Yeah, so I, I like honey, and <laughs> I eat a lot of honey. And I'd, I would get all sorts of different kinds of honey. Laura would buy them for me in just little jars of um, different types of flower honey, you know, orange honey, clover honey, tupelo honey. And I'd, I'd sit down and just have a little bowl after work uh, of honey. And one day I was like, huh, I really like honey. wonder how hard it'd be to make my own honey. And so I started getting on the Internet and doing some research and reading and didn't seem that hard. So... Uh, Laura came home one day and I said, hey, we're going to get some bees. <laughs> and she said, no, we're not. <laughs> and I kind of persisted a little bit. And, and she knows me pretty well. And I don't always follow through with things. And so she said, OK, well, fine. If you, you know, get books, read about bees, go to the local beekeeping association and join that and go to the, their meetings and learn more. Um, you do that. Then next year we can get bees. Wow. And I, I did all of that. I actually, one of the radiologists that, that I work with, uh, Greg DePrisco, um, I was looking over some films with him one day and um, was mentioning that I was going to get bees. And he said, oh, we're going to get bees too. So we, we did it together. And oh, that is so cool. Okay, we're going we're gonna to be right back. We've got to take a quick break here, and then we're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more. Thanks, honey. The Mosquito Steve Radio Show is back. Here's your host, Mosquito Steve. Stevie played guitar. Here we are, back with um, my guest today, Meg Curry, and of course the great young Dr. Scott Zelensky. I can't get over it. I really can't. I'm sorry. Next time, I promise I won't talk about the youth thing at all. I'll I be older just, then. I'm about to ask you for your ID, though. I'm just. You got to say, I mean, he's got it. We had to get a chair, extra high chair in here so he could reach the microphone no i'm just kidding he's he looks like an adult except he looks like a very young adult it's just amazing so so evidently honey is good for keeping you young 
Um, I can see that. It can work. So what are the health benefits of honey? So I'm sitting here looking at this thing. This says this type of raw honey kills every kind of bacteria that scientists could throw at them. And um, so here, I'm going to give this to you. I want you to tell us about Manuka honey. Manuka honey. So are, is there like, is there a Dallas honeybee? Uh, I know there's an Africanized. You're not raising Africanized honeybees, are you? Not usually. Okay, okay. Like, <laughs> so is there a specific species that um, that you're raising? Well, even the Africanized honeybees are Apis mellifera is the, the kind of uh, the species. Um, but there's different subtypes and different genetics uh, that can be thrown in there. The Africanized bees are really just more aggressive. And we do have Africanized bees up here in Texas. And when the bees go out and mate locally, they may mate with some Africanized bees and start becoming more aggressive. Um, and you can actually tell the difference in a hive. You can tell when one's become Africanized because the bees sting you more more uh, aggressively. And then usually, even if you've got bees that aren't happy, if you walk 20 feet away from the hive or so, they'll all go back. But the Africanized bees will keep following you for 100 yards and it can be interesting. So how do you know if a bee is happy or not? Because I, I've <laughs> got to think they're depressed right now because the heat, right? So they got to be sitting around like drinking or something. What do they do? How do you know they're depressed? Well, so when you, when you go into the hive, um, they're all flying around and, and you can actually hear them them flying and it just actually becomes louder and there's there's some change in the tone and then also just how often they're landing on you and trying to sting you. Um, when you've got nice docile bees that are happy, you know, they'll just be flying around, won't sting you, they might land on you a little bit, um, but they can have le different levels of aggressiveness. Okay, so I just assume since you're an expert, that you don't get stung by bees. Is that not the case? That's not the case. <laughs> I mean, do you get stung every day? Do you just get stung no, when you're so, hanging out in the backyard? So, oh, no, not not hanging out in the backyard. That's that's perfectly fine. And and my bees are on the side of my house, just right outside our dining room window, so we can we can watch them. But there's nothing keeping them from going out in the backyard. Um, but they don't hang out just in the area of the hive. They when they go out to forage for um, nectar and pollen. They kind of fly up and out up to three miles, so it's not like there's a cloud of bees around my house. <laughs> um, in the backyard, there's really a couple of bees, but not a whole lot. So you just drive by, and you go, oh my god, that guy's raising bees! Look at all the bees <laughs> flying in there. No, my <laughs> neighbor didn't know we had bees for four years. Wow! Um, the the guy who's right next to us, um, you know, the bees are ten feet away from his house, separated by the fence, and. Only reason he knew we had bees was I was cleaning the extracting equipment that's stainless steel, and he saw me doing that. And he said, "Oh, you making beer over here?" And I, wow! And I said, no, we're that <laughs> <got> honey. <laughs> <laughs> making beer too, though, aren't you? Uh, oh, just I'd like oh. to. I've never gotten into that. Really? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Laura could do that when she's sitting around doing nothing. I hear she does <laughs> nothing. She just yeah, she's, <laughs> she doesn't do much. Well, you're looking to be investigated. <laughs> I know I am, aren't I? That's, that's true. I, didn't, I keep forgetting about that part yeah. of it. Uh, yeah, okay. Just kidding, Laura. I've actually, I've never met Laura. I need to meet, meet her sometime. But um, so uh, I first, I heard, Scott heard about us through somebody else and I, your sister, I think. Sister-in-law. Yep, yep sister-in-law. And so um, uh, so you were interested in us because of our natural products. And mm -hmm. and so far, you haven't seen any effect uh, from our yard sprays and misting on the bees at all. No, right? I haven't had any, any problems with the bees. That is so incredible. Um, but now somebody that does have problems with bees is Meg. So Meg has a story. I want to hear about the story and what, what – uh, okay, and then I want to talk about the being allergic. This is this is actually mm -hmm. a very important thing. So tell us about your story. Okay, so just so you all know, during the break we were talking about <laughs> being stung. And I said that one time when I was a kid I got stung. And I was told basically from my reaction that either the next time I get stung could be nothing or it could be fatal. So I have an EpiPen that I don't really carry around with me. So I guess I live on the edge. Uh, I think I was about seven or eight. We went to West, to the West Fest in West Texas. And I got stung by a yellow jacket. And it stung Which is me. not a bee. Well, there you go. And right. um, I got, see, this is why I need to talk to a doctor. It's a wasp. It, uh, is it a wasp? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm allergic to wasps. 
But no, I got uh, I got stung on my ankle and uh, from my ankle all the way up to my knee, my leg swelled, like you mentioned, and it turned black. And then I started having breathing problems. So, uh, you know, they stepped, they started with a Benadryl pretty quickly mm-hmm. and I was able to, to come back from it. But I guess I've been allergy tested since then. And they just said because of that reaction. And I, I react pretty badly to mosquitoes, too. So you're yeah. really giving bees a bad rap here for no reason. Apparently, <laughs> I've been wasps. afraid of the wrong. Nobody likes wasps. In- Nobody <laughs> likes wasps. So yeah, the bees are okay, but the wasps. Which one dies when it stings you? The Honey. bees die yeah. when, yeah, when they sting you. So they can only sting you once. So if there's only one bee around and they sting you, you don't have to worry about getting <laughs> stung again. You got a, one wasp around, they can keep going. So, so what you did, what you had, does sound like a real allergy. So mm-hmm. if you, any but time you start having trouble breathing related to something that you're saying you're allergic to, that's a real allergy. Yeah. When you get stung by bees, the natural response really is to get a lot of swelling in that area. So I've been stung on my hand and it, it'll swell up to almost two times, you know, normal size. Um, I've been stung on my ear and it looks like I'm in a cartoon with a big, you know, <laughs> big ear. Um, and that's not an allergy. And that's what a lot of people say, oh, well, I swell up when I get stung by a bee. I've got an allergy to, to bee stings. And that's not not a real allergy. If you get stuff away from where you got stung, if you get hives, if you start having trouble breathing, those sorts of things say, yeah, you do have a real allergy and that's that's something to worry about. Huh. Okay. So I'm allergic to alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> I break out into handcuffs when I drink. So um, that's definitely a, a... Yeah. You should stay away from that. No. it's Yeah. I definitely do. But you know what the thing is, is it's those things that I'm allergic to that I you know want the most. I'm allergic to sugar. I can't. Once I start, I cannot stop. And so, uh, yep. So I'm but but I don't have any allergies. That's why I can go out and take thousands of mosquito bites. And you know, yeah, it's it's. I go home and I put hot water on them, and you know, they're gone. It's no big deal. So, uh, but I'm That's I'm hearing nice. a lot more about kids that are getting mosquito bites. That it does. It swells up really big, <clears throat> and they get rashes and all kinds of things that come with it. So um, have you, I mean, does that make any sense? Is there a reason why the the bites uh, from mosquitoes or bees or anything would start getting worse than they used to be? I don't really know. Okay, but, you're supposed to know um, everything. I'm not going to be really useful let's, on that one. Let's no. just say antibiotics. <laughs> antibiotics really uh, decrease the body fighting naturally, right? I don't know about that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Point. We won't go there. No, I want to see. Come on, point, counterpoint. Let's see that. Um, so I, I get, I'm get. i fearful about taking too many antibiotics, so I understand. When I got this thing, this rash and all this other stuff, they uh, shot me, gave me a shot in the butt with a bunch of antibiotics and then gave me 10 days' worth after that. And, it, and I had these fears that it's like, you know, it's going to keep me from being able to fight this myself. And um, the very last time, the third time I got it, we just used steroids and steroid cream to help my body learn to, you know, fight the stuff itself. So, a- Antibiotics have their role. Um, they get overused a lot when people have a cold and go to the doctor and get upset when the doctor tells them it's a virus, you don't need antibiotics. They came to the doctor to get antibiotics and yep. that's what they want to leave with. Um, so sometimes they can be overused, um, but used in, in the right times, they're life-saving and wonderful drugs. So what is it that you use? Cause you, um, you only, you don't just do the surgery. You also recommend, um, like chemo treatments and things like that too, right? Are you, do you, do you, do you strategize people's entire recovery from cancer or? Yeah. Me? So, um, especially in say pancreas cancer, we, we talk a lot about multidisciplinary care where it's not just the surgeon it's kind of everybody who's going to be involved in taking care of that patient from the radiologist that reads the um, CT scans and x-rays, the gastroenterologist that does the biopsies, the oncologist that gives the chemotherapy, the radiation oncologist that um, gives radiation, the pathologist that looks at all the specimens and tell us what we have. Um, we usually talk about the patients in, in a meeting with everybody there and kind of come up with a uh, a unified plan as to how we're going to treat the patients. Wow. See, I always wonder, because I, I don't I don't ever have to go to the hospital, but but my dad has to go. He's at that age. He goes there a lot. And so uh, so he has to go, and he'll and it's, and I always wonder, like, the doctor is gone for, like, 24 hours. And it's like, well, how can you be taking care of him if you're never here? And so I always wonder what you guys do when y'all are not in the patient's room. So 
As surgeons, I'm in the operating room quite yes, often. Yeah, when I'm not yeah. in the rooms. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. Got me on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> I, I read on this uh, meso mesothelioma. I did it. Um, you are a f a fond of a procedure called shake and bake. So is that just, tell me what it, what are the chemicals that you put into my stomach and shake them around? You actually shake them around. It says you shake the custard. Yeah, I have literally. So for certain cancers that have spread around people's bellies, we'll go in and do a really big operation to cut out all of the cancer spots, but then to try to kill the microscopic stuff that's still there, we'll use hot chemotherapy and circulate that through their body at a higher temperature then we can give through IV in order to, or, I'm sorry, higher concentration and temperature than we can give through IV to try to kill the, the rest of the cancer there. We do it for colon cancer and, um, and mesothelioma relatively often. It's a big, so, long operation. Is hours. it making a difference? Because, I mean, I, I know when I was, you know, I've always thought people just don't survive stomach cancer or pancreas cancer. And so is that changing? Are we getting better at, better at treatment, training it? Definitely. And the stuff that we're doing um, is really all trying to improve uh, the survival for pancreas cancer um, with the studies and the new new treatments that we're working on. Cool. All right. Well, we've got another break coming up. And um, when we get back, we're going to talk more about that. I can't help it. Every time I hear shake and bake, I want to go, <laughs> yeah, my mom made shake and bake and I helped. <laughs> that was that commercial when I was growing up. So uh, anyways, lots more bee talk and other kinds of talk, talk about your health here uh, with Dr. Scott Selensky and Meg Curry. We'll be right back after this word. That's me, Mosquito Steve. And I've got an incredible guest here, Dr. Scott Selensky. Um, Gosh, it was hard to get you on here. I'm telling you, so I was nervous about it because, you know, it's funny because I honestly, I was a little, it's like you weren't responding to emails very well and stuff. And, and, uh, and then, you know, when he, when I found out he was a doctor, which I just had no idea. I just knew you had bees in your yard. Mm -hmm. So when I found out he was a doctor, it's like, okay, I gotta, guess I got to give him a little break because you're probably busy. It. You're probably a little busy. I'm thinking. Uh, most days. What days, how many hours a week do you work? I mean, is um, probably between 60 and 80 hours a week. Okay, okay. So that's what not I as, do. Not so as I can much be a as doctor. I did in residency. That was more towards 110 hours. Uh, wow. So I'm like a doctor of mosquitoes then because mm -hmm. I put in 60 to 80 hours a week. Okay, there you go. The doctor is in. So, uh, <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. I just I couldn't help that. So I have to ask. So um, uh, you did say you said we're getting better at treating uh, pancreas and stomach cancer. Do you have, I mean, is there any specifics? Do you have a percentage where we at 10% before now we're close to half the cases or is there any? So pancreas cancer, um, is probably the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths, maybe about three now. And by 2030, we're expecting it to be number two. Um, the five year survival over the past 10 years has actually improved from 4% to 8%. Wow. The majority Golly. of the people that we're curing are the people that we're catching early. And so if we catch it at an earlier stage when we can operate on it, then we're, we're more in the 25% range. So it's not anywhere near where we want it to be, but making progress. So what is the sign or symptom that says, hey, I need to go get my pancreas checked? So the main thing that people end up with is turning yellow, getting jaundiced. Okay. Because, um, but it's too late then, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. The, the issue is those are the people that we catch earlier because your bile duct goes through your pancreas, and if your bile duct gets blocked off, you turn yellow. So if the cancer's in the right spot, you'll turn yellow at an earlier time period and when we can still take care of it. Other parts of your pancreas away from the, um, from the bile duct, oftentimes you just have kind of some vague pain that's not, not bad enough to take you to the doctor until something gets too far along. Wow. Okay, so um, I have wrote this question down. I have to know. So uh, we're getting back to bees here because we're depressing everybody. I don't want everybody. Everybody, hey, hey, wake up, everybody. We're not talking about any more depressing things. We're going to talk about bees again and how we're killing all our, our pollinators. <laughs> that's, that's not depressing at all. But I have to know. Somebody brought it up uh, today just an off, you know, had nothing to do with the radio show today. Um, but he was talking about a big beehive that they had <clears throat> in this park. Sorry. <clears throat> Does that work? Y'all can't hear me now. Okay, how's that now? I'm sorry. I had to get cough. So uh, this guy had this big beehive in this park. Who do you call if you've got a big beehive that you know? How do you know somebody's going to come out and 
take care of the bees like they should versus just come out and spray them and kill them all? Yeah, so that's a good question. So a lot of times people see a bee swarm. So see a bunch of bees flying somewhere and then go land in their tree and see a big ball of bees up in their tree. Those guys, or more accurately girls, um, are looking for a new home. They're not actually going to stay there. So if you just wait four hours or a day, most of the time they will just leave and go somewhere else. So you don't have to necessarily call somebody to take care of that. Um, if you do want to call somebody to take care of it, calling your local beekeepers association is probably going to be the best way to go. Because for beekeepers, those are free bees. We can just come bring a box, knock the bees off into our box and take them home. And we've got a new beehive. Wow. You actually um, do that. Mm -hmm. I've done that for some people before. Yeah. I'll be darned. Calls from friends that they've got bees in their yard. Um, so wherever you are, the local beekeepers association and here in Dallas, the Trinity Valley B B Trinity Valley Beekeepers Association is is our local beekeeper association, and you can find them on Facebook or um, on the internet, and just email them, and they've they've actually got a a network that somebody sends a request, they'll email out a bunch of the beekeepers and say, hey, somebody has bees here. Anybody want to go help them? Okay. So tell people how do they tell the difference between a bunch of bees and a bunch of wasps. I mean, I know I just, it's just like auto, almost automatic to me, but I guess that's not automatic for everybody. Um, they look different. Yeah, well, there um, you go. Okay. So if they've got fuzz on yeah. them, they're probably a bee. Yeah. Was the wasps, wasps are, are generally a little bit more shiny. elongated and, yeah. and shinier. Yeah. yeah. They've got their, the wasp body parts are more segmented too. Usually you've got a specific head, uh, abdomen, and butt. I don't know what to call it. The rear. <laughs> the the, the stinger the, in holder. between the head and the abdomen. <laughs> so, uh, and bees are, you know, they're, they're uh, stocky like me. I'm more like a bee. Mm -hmm. And so, um, okay, so we've determined now that we've got, Bees, bees, so people can actually leave them alone because they are. What do you mean they're looking for a new home? If that, they, so those bees that are flying around are actually mm -hmm. like scouts. So, well, no, that's the whole hive when you see them when you or half okay. of the hive. So, when in order to start a new bee colony, you don't just have one bee go off and start a new family. It's actually an old colony has gotten too big for where it lives, and the queen lays some eggs to create a new queen for the, the hive that they're leaving behind. And then the queen and half the hive actually fly out wow. and, and are that bee ball that you're seeing. And so that takes one colony and turns it into two. So yeah. how do you keep the bees that you're raised? Because you, you've got, how many hives do you have? I've got two hives. you got two hives. And, and you actually, how, you said you got gallons of honey. Is that every year you get gallons of honey? Um, how much honey do you get? Yeah, that? so um, we just harvested about 120 pounds of honey wow. uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that was after getting probably about 90 pounds earlier in the spring, and I'll probably get another 60 pounds or so at the end of the year. Here. Oh, my gosh. My so bees have just been very productive. Busy and, bees. Mm, yeah, very busy, busy bees. That's good. See, you're, I'm not the mm -hmm. only one with corn here. <laughs> All right, so so uh, what do you do with honey? Um Use it in my coffee every morning instead of sugar. Um, gives it a nice taste. Um, use it on my biscuits. Give it away to friends and family. Um, you can cook with it. You can do all sorts of stuff. Do you sell it? I haven't actually gotten around to selling it okay. um, at this point. That's well, the I've jar put. looked very professional. I, well, my, my mom's a home ec teacher, and she's got friends in design, <laughs> and so she's had her friends design nice little labels for me. And wow. Kind of fun. I bet you they make good teacher gifts for the holidays mm -hmm. and those kinds of things, too. Yeah. Actually, yep. yeah, I'm actually going to be hollering at you about that <laughs> pretty soon. So that's uh, – uh, we'll make a business. We'll put it on my website. We'll sell Scott's honey, Laura's honey. <laughs> yeah. I do have Dr. a question C's for him, Okay. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about this earlier, but I thought maybe the listeners might uh, find value in it, and that is I thought that local honey helps you with your allergies, but you were saying – so there's, there's no good data on that that I've found. I haven't looked in, in about a year or so, but the, we were saying the best study that I found um, was a small study. only had like 36 people in it, and they divided them into three groups. One group they gave local honey to, one group they gave um, lo or supermarket honey to, and the other group they gave honey-flavored sugar water. And all these people had seasonal allergies and – they didn't find any difference in, 
in the allergies after they treated people. So um, one of the reasons that people think that it might not be so good for seasonal allergies is most people are allergic to grass or tree pollen, and that's not what the bees are gathering. They're doing flowers. Um, so even if it's local stuff, they might not be helping you out there. That being said, um, I feel like my allergies have gotten a little better having having my honey all the time, but that may or may not be I'm going to keep eating honey. And Winnie the Pooh is <clears throat> one of my favorite characters too, so I'm going to mm. keep up with the honey. But all right, we've got just a few minutes left, so I want to key in on this um, CCD Um which is the colony collapse disorder and mm-hmm. things like that. Because this is really, this is the important message um, as far as organics and natural products go and pesticides and chemicals and all that. So neonicotinoids are um, actually the most widely used pesticide across the, the world are neonicotinoids. And I think there's one in particular called um, imidic Imidacloprid, Im- imidacloprid, you could probably pronounce it. You don't, you've never even heard of it. Probably that's actually a brand name, but uh, but it is a nic- ne- neonicotinoid, and those are doing what to bees? <clears throat> well, the most people think that they're related to the colony collapse disorder. When people hear about the bees disappearing, um, started back in about 2006. Over the winter, um, beekeepers were noticing that. Uh, they had a lot higher losses of their colonies. Play, people were losing 30 to 90 percent of their colonies over the over the winter, and it wasn't the normal problem of the bees running out of food and um, going in, and the hives just empty. Um, the bees were kind of disappearing, except for the queen and the and the eggs and the brood, um, and that's been being investigated over the past 10 years, and it's thought to be related to the neonicotinoid um, pesticides as well as um, other factors associated with them. Um, my favorite is the Varroa destructor mite, um, which is a pest that bees kind of have had for a while. But the combination of that and the and the pesticides seems to be um, contributing to the colony collapse. And there's a new study out um, was just on in the Guardian uh, talking about the reduction of. So I was reading that the bees actually there's two things that the neonicotinoids do. One of them is like the drones actually get um uh, they get they don't learn is basically what happens they end, end up staying around doing nothing and then the uh but the other thing is that <clears throat> their sperm um is reduced by 40 percent so they're unable to reproduce as well <clears throat> is that yeah that, that's the only role of the drones is actually reproduction they don't do anything useful for the hive all they do is eat the food and and mate um so if they're not going out and mating, and if their sperm that they have aren't working, then that's obviously a problem. Well, that's the same with mosquitoes, too. Why is it in the insects, it's uh, the males that are lazy and do nothing? Then, uh, But, I mean, it's important. It's, they, they, humans, they have a we use. we have that problem, too. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> no, 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 we're not going to go there. We're not going to talk politics. That's all we need is it. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, well, I think, that's, I think it's really critical. So what would you recommend that people do? Um, if they want to get rid of insects in their yard, but they don't want to harm the bees, um, how do they protect themselves from mosquitoes, from chiggers, from fleas? I call someone like you. That's, <laughs> there you that's go. what I'd do. Golly, did you hear that? Can we record? Let's put that in a commercial. Okay. We're out of time. I can't believe that. What a great thing to end on. I appreciate you <laughs> saying that. Just call Mosquito Steve. So, you know what? You can call me. Email Steve at Mosquito Steve. Check out my website, mosquitosteve.com. Anytime you have a question, just let me know. Steve at mosquitosteve.com. Um, I appreciate you guys listening to us. Uh, we got more next week. Uh, please join us every Saturday right here. You can listen to us worldwide, streaming on iHeartRadio, Talk Radio 1190. And you guys have a great week and uh, stay protected.